Well, thanks for again for everybody persevering to the last session of the day. And I wanted to talk about uh, labor or not labor, business history and labor history and all the many other subfields that we have in Canadian history. Because we have conferences, we have business conferences, we have labor conferences, we have environmental history conferences, gender conferences, urban history conferences. And how do they relate together? Where does business history fit and where do we see it is really what I want to talk about today. How does it fit into other subfields? And because business history, clearly if we're at a Canadian Business History Association conference, is resurging again and it's taking on different forms. And I would want to emphasize to everybody that the fact that um, Canadian history is, is divided into subfields is okay. I think sometimes it concerns historians that we're not writing grand narrative histories like Donald Creighton anymore, but we're doing this because we know more about it. We know more in terms of sources and in terms of lived experience, and that this is a reason we have subfields. And I don't think that we should necessarily divide them into hierarchies, but instead to see them as complementary more than anything else. And I think it's important for us to be looking at, and I'm also going to talk today, talk today about why we need to look at corporations and look more broadly at business history in Canada. You know, other major institutions in Canadian society have received lots of rigorous critique from historians, churches, government, universities. Corporations can take it. It's okay. I don't think there need to be any concern about letting historians into corporate archives or looking at more in, in, in providing more insightful critiques and using a more, uh, a more critical methodology because this will add to our collective knowledge and ultimately make, make things better and improve the, the, the nature of business history in the country. And why do we look, need to look at corporations? Well, in the lives of Canadians, capital rivals the state in terms of the policy-making process. Right? Most people work for, work for corporations and work for businesses. Businesses provide most of our goods and services. They shape our urban space. They shape our lives in so many ways. You will spend more of your working, more, more of the best years of your life at work with your coworkers, probably working in a private corporation. Well, then you will anything else. All right? And also, we have that emerging trend in Canada. We have two forms of history. We have public and private history, and where rarely do the two seem to meet. But people still become very impassioned about this. We only have seen this within the past last month when we started talking about the continued usefulness of statues of Sir John A., which in turn in itself came out of discussion in the, from the southern United States about why there are 1,500 monuments primarily across the former Confederate states, and they're all put up at, mostly after 1900. Why are they there? Right? So people, even if they don't know much about history since maybe grade 8, still have a lot of opinions about this, and they will surely have opinions about the role of corporations in business in Canadian society. All right? Now, in terms of methodology that we have right now, um, in Canada we do not have a dedicated business history journal, nor do, nor do I think we are capable of supporting a dedicated business history journal. Um, as the president of the Canadian Committee on Labor History, and I can, I can assure you that we have enough challenges supporting one labor history journal, never mind a business history journal as well. Um, but there are several journals in the, uh, in the United States and abroad, Business History Review, Enterprise and Society, Management and Organizational History, Business History, uh, these are just a few. And interestingly, having now attended several business history conferences over the past three years, I've discovered that they're all very receptive to hearing about Canada. It isn't one of these situations I think a lot of Canadians historians think, well, if I send an abstract to an international conference, maybe nobody's going to be interested. If somebody sends an abstract off to the ABH conference, for example, or the Association of Business Historians conference in the UK, they're going to be receptive. We had a, a CBHA sponsored a, a, an all-Canadian panel there this past summer, and we've also had Canadian participation in the past. Your, European Business History Association as well. So Canada does matter, and Canadian historians can contribute to the international discussions, which is another key point. Business history globally is quite um, complementary. Uh, people around the world reference each other's works. It's not at all very much siloed, whereas labor history, uh, the labor historians do talk to their American peers and to the ones in Western Europe, but oftentimes because of problems of language, what is going on in, say, in Mexico or Latin America is not very well known, or in other parts of Europe where English is not spoken. Okay? And, but when we're looking at the work that's being produced now in Canada, there is a lot of new research being produced that could be called business history, even if it's not being called business history. So certainly uh, Mark Kuhlberg's book that won the CBHA Prize uh, could be called business history or certainly was regarded as such by the CBHA, but it could also be environmental history, right? It could be the history of Ontario. Uh, Andrew's book, okay, I'll name some names because they're here. Andrew Ross's book in the NHL, is it history of sports and leisure, 
Is it the history of, of entertainment? Is it a business history? Right? Is it a gender history? Because it's a game overwhelmingly played by men. How does it shape male gender identity? Right? Craig Heron, um, my old dissertation supervisor who just graduated from New York, produced uh, an absolute huge book on the history of, history of working class Hamilton called Lunch Bucket Lives, which could be labor history, business history, urban history, gender, government policy history, environmental history, a lot of different things. You could pack a lot into 600 pages, double paned, and he managed to do it and find a journal, a, a publisher that would take it as well. Um, and I also wanted to mention also Janice's book on us Canadian snack foods, which could be social <laughs> history as well, or business history, the history of food. And also uh, another one, Steve Penfold's book on the, uh, a mile of make-believe about the Santa Claus parade, uh, the Eaton Santa Claus parade, which really shows how a corporation become, really creates and sustains a cultural event, right? That something that comes, becomes wrapped up so much in terms of people's childhood experience and becomes associated with the city, Toronto. Right? But it nonetheless is there to promote the corporation. Right? And also, my, I'm also doing some, re, some work right now on management education history, which I'm sure somebody's going to say in an education faculty, well, he's doing education history, not necessarily management history. But, need, and, but that doesn't mean the twain do not meet. Now, what are the challenges? Obviously, um, having researched both corporations and unions now, they are very concerned about their images, uh, corporations particularly about their brand image. But unions are more willing to share their resources. Nonprofits are more likely to let historians into their archive materials if they have them. And I hope corporations will, too, be willing to do so. There are corporate archives available, that, but it tends to be the stuff that's in the public archives tends to be um, from corporations that are defunct. Eaton's, for example, the T. Eaton Family Arch uh, Fonds, which are at the Archive of Ontario up here at York and Toronto, are one example. Um, but I hope that there is more willingness over time, and I hope the CBHA can contribute to the process of encouraging corporations to release more of their, of their archival data. And also, in terms of the, the roots of Canadian business history are unique compared to the United States, which is, I think is an important point. Canadian business history originates in history departments. In the United States, it comes out of business schools, principally the Harvard Business School, which in terms of methodology has, has, has created much different roots than it has in Canada. And also, um, we have a number of people, including a few, one or two in this room, who have long, made long contributions to the creation of business history and the study of it in Canada. However, there is really nobody quite like Alfred Chandler in Canadian business historiography. We don't have this one all-encompassing figure. And I'm not even sure for the United States that it's necessarily been a good thing that they've had one all-encompassing figure. Um, Alfred Chandler is referenced a lot. This would be like us talking about Innes all the time, although Innes is coming back in the, fun, in the vogue a little bit. But also, as I just mentioned, Andrew's book and Mark's book and um, Janice's book, there's other things. In, in, in indigenous history is very big right now. Environmental history, all of these link also to business history. right? So when we pick up books and we think about doing research or we read articles, we, we, I think we need to think more about what, what are all the fields that we could find in this particular piece of work, not in just looking for one. And to tar turn again to the popular aspect of popular history, uh, we live right now in profoundly and disturbingly ahistoric times. Right? One of the countries that helped found Canada, the United Kingdom, voted to leave the U European Union by a narrow margin and did so partly because of a perceived influx of immigrant hordes that were coming across the country's borders. Oftentimes these were non-white, undocumented uh, immigrants. The fact that much of this despised non-white immigration came from former colonies and British protectorates and not from mainland Europe as feared, never seemed to exit the and to enter the deliberations around Brexit. Indeed, the sun may never have set in the British Empire, but it is absent from history classes in the United Kingdom's elementary and secondary schools. The country neighboring us to the south, where I also work, elected a billionaire president who had previously emerged from bankruptcy proceedings, who ran on a platform of essentially upending a post-World War II economic order that revolved around American interests. Canadians have not yet done anything as drastic as this. We haven't elected a reality TV star. We've got somebody who likes taking selfies, pretty much. Right? But we have not got a situation yet in Canada, even though there's been talk about populism here at the conference today. We do not have a populist a populist movement today that looks like it does in a lot, in many places in Western Europe or in the Southern Union or in the United States, right? And one of the reasons is we don't have 
and I could be argued with this by social, other social historians, we don't have a mass group of class of people who feel completely disenfranchised from the political process. Right? But we have to find these people. We as historians have a duty to find these people and give them a voice. And I put this up here because this is a reflection of something I found in my own research because I've studied deindustrialization and job loss among unionized workers and also non-unionized workers. And finding information about displaced unionized workers is very easy because unions want to get it out there. They want to get the message out there that their workers are losing their jobs. So if you just go on Google and said, photo of striking union members is no problem at all finding one. Photo of laid off manager. That is an actor because you can't really find photos of actual laid off managers. Right? To be non-unionized and lose your job is to be lost to posterity, which is really tragic. Now, why, does this, why would this matter for businesses? Well, we know from surveys that younger, younger people coming out of colleges and universities are not lining up to go, go climb the corporate ladder. They want to be self-employed, to be freelancers, and do things like that. But they've looked at their own parents' experience and think, why do I want to do this? That's one of the reasons it matters. Okay. Interestingly, the, the actors for the laid-off manager are always attractive as well. There you go. There's some gender to that. Okay. But we're also facing another thing that I think that historians could talk to business about and understand within business terms, and this is demographic change. And this is an image for the baby boom generation who are now entering retirement. So, and this is yet, yet another example of what does business history look like. These are images from two CBC productions from the 1970s, The King of Kensington and The Beachcombers. I picked Chief Dan George rather than Relic and Bruno Gerussi for this particular picture. Okay, but these were popular media, uh, forms of popular media that were created by a crown corporation, right? That they were nonetheless referenced by Canadians of that particular generation. But they're changing now, right? Because also to go from, with demographic change, we're facing a situation now in Canada that the nuclear family, that, again, this is just another, another example, and there is family history. There's the, fa the history of Canadian families. Would a family look like in 1950? and this is from Leave it to Beaver, an American media source, looks a lot different now. The meaning of a family and what that means for businesses changed profoundly. We have single-parent families. We have extended families. We have families led by same-sex parents. Right? And I also wanted to put this up. Uh, the, this is an image from Pride 2017, um, and there is Prime Minister Selfie again. He's very ubiquitous. He loves cameras. Andrew Shear better learn to love cameras pretty soon. Um, but... Another thing that historians could talk about, and it's interesting to look through with business, and I was, this is sort of a coda to my presentation I put on last night, is that business, in, in labor history, we talk a lot about industrial legality, what is permissible and impermissible. And this, also, this idea also appears in indigenous history, what is legal and illegal for a specific group. We haven't talked about what commercial legality or business legality looks like, or how business decides what legitimacy looks like for a group, right? So just very recently at York University in the history department, there's somebody named Tom Hooper who just who, who, uh, wrote a dissertation on gay bathhouse raids in Toronto in the early 1970s. And I'm sure you're thinking, why is he talking about bathhouse raids? Because Hooper's talking about why they were illegal, why the police were raiding them. So if you fast forward 46 years, we now have an event, Toronto Pride, which is considered a huge economic engine for the city which is ag aggressively promoted by the city. Right? We have gay people running businesses, some of them, like the, the CEO of Apple, running very big businesses. But this, represent, this shows, and business likes this. Business likes the Pride Parade. They, you know, they like cranking up the hotel rates in Toronto for a week. But this shows that over time, business, business views what is legitimate and illegitimate and confers that on different groups. And it also shows, though, as well, that business doesn't want to go back on this, which I think is a really important point, that we couldn't suddenly say that it's not legitimate to be gay or it's not legitimate for Aboriginal people to be running businesses and be involved in Canadian society. That business can be progressive, I think, is another important message here. Okay. So overall, to conclude, um, this is all, this is trained, the history of business, capital business in Canada is trained that needs to be recrossed by historians, um, obviously looking at pride parades and how we went from gay bathhouse raids to pride parades and how the nuclear family has changed. That's a lot different than counting, you know, the number of bushels of wheat produced in a province in one decade or something like that. But this is a much more social history approach to the study of business, right? But there are key issues here that we need to avoid things like the rise of nativism. The historians need to be able to contribute 
new analyses to, to try to pr provide a more factually grounded account of the past than is happening in other countries right now. Right? Race, gender, class, and, class, and ethnicity need to be incorporated into business history. And again, to return to initial initial point, corporations are the key vehicles of capitalism in Canada. They've ap operated here since the Hudson's Bay Company. They've, tra again, traditionally been the key, key creators of employment. And I would hope the business will embrace the prospect of being the subject of more historical analysis and be, again, willing to help us reveal more about their important role in Canadian society. Thank you.